Hello, historians, and welcome to the first presentation from my class on Unit 1, Mesopotamia and Egypt. In this lecture video, we've got a lot of exciting topics to talk about, beginning with the Paleolithic period, moving on to the Neolithic era, culminating in the Neolithic Revolution, which changed the fate of human societies. Speaking of, we're going to look at some of the first societies that develop in the West in the area known as Mesopotamia in modern-day Iraq and Kuwait, along with Egypt. We'll look at political developments in those regions. We'll look at religious developments in those regions. We'll look at ways in which religion was used to cement political power by important political leaders such as Sargon I and Hammurabi. We'll also take time to get into some social development, looking at the role of slavery in these early societies, looking at family relations in these societies, looking at gender relations in these societies. And we're going to end by examining some cultural artifacts, particularly writing and the ways that it was used by both Mesopotamian societies and in Egypt, but also getting into things like farming technology, mathematics, religious mythology, and all of those other topics. Be sure to, before you get into the details of this presentation, bring up the discussion forum that's located in the appropriate module in our course LMS. And as you're watching this video, it would probably be a good idea for you to be jotting down some notes that are relevant to the questions that I've posed in that discussion forum for you to answer. So that way you're not trying to just watch the lecture presentation mindlessly and then wing the discussion forum at the end, but rather you're taking some notes that are going to help you remember the information that's in this lecture video, and then you can answer the questions in the discussion forum a little bit better when you get to it later on. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get to the video, shall we? Hello everyone, welcome again to the first presentation for Western Civilization 1. If you're listening to this as a registered student in my course, you'll be watching these video lectures that will give you the basic narrative, meaning the story of what happened throughout Western civilization. Each module in our course LMS will include a link to the video lecture I'd like you to watch. There are also discussion forums that go along with each video lecture, including this one, that are also in each respective module in the course LMS. After you've watched this presentation and answered the discussion forum questions, you'll be well on your way to completing the first module for Western Civ 1. The rest of the items in each module contain things like primary and secondary sources to read, documentaries to watch, and any other resources I've included to help you learn about the content and skills I'd like you to learn. Without further ado then, let's jump into the material for Unit 1, Mesopotamia and Egypt. I'll give you a moment to access the first discussion forum so that you can think about your answers to those questions as you watch and listen. Now that you've got the first forum ready to go, on to Unit 1. The first unit of study will examine the earliest civilizations that exist in the West, Mesopotamia and Egypt. Before we begin looking at those cultures more closely, let's lay the foundation for the beginning of human societies in the West by going back in time to the Paleolithic era. The Paleolithic or Old Stone Age lasted from roughly 2 million years ago to about 11,000 BCE. Tool-making hominids, the group of creatures including humans, and from which modern humans have evolved, emerged roughly 2 million years ago. The tools they created were made out of stone, hence the term Stone Age for this period of human history. Also, around 164,000 years ago, humans developed the capacity to control fire. If we fast forward a bit, we see some new developments happening in the period from 40,000 to 11,000 BCE. Stone tools were still being made by humans, but the craftsmanship and skill had increased remarkably. In addition, roughly 40,000 years ago, anatomically modern humans left Africa and began to settle in other continents like Europe and Asia, and much later in the Americas. Humans during this period lived in small bands of hunter-gatherers. They were nomadic, meaning they followed wild herds of animals and the growing seasons of wild crops, never settling in one location for very long. 
These bands were small in number, with many having fewer than 100 people. Due to their nomadic lifestyle, individuals were not able to accumulate large amounts of resources and wealth. And so we believe that these bands of hunter-gatherers were largely egalitarian, meaning social classes did not exist, and there was a rough equality between individual members of the band. We also believe that genders were relatively equal for these bands of humans. Women were the ones who gave birth to new members, obviously, but we think that both men and women played a role in raising new children. We also believe that both men and women participated in hunting and gathering. We also have evidence of the culture of early humans. These images come from Chauvet Cave in France, and they're estimated to be nearly 35,000 years old. You can clearly see the artistic skill in the depictions of various animals like horses and rhinos. Caves in Germany have also produced musical instruments made out of animal bones. Although we can't be 100% sure of the purpose of cave paintings like these, theories range from spiritual uses to people at this time simply wanting to portray the world around them. Now that we've covered the first topic for this lecture, let's review the main points. First, the Paleolithic Age refers to the Old Stone Age, when tool-making hominids used stone to make tools. Second, around 40,000 years ago, anatomically modern humans left Africa to settle other continents, existing in small nomadic bands of usually less than 100 members. Third, we believe these bands were generally egalitarian, meaning a rough equality existed between members of the band. And finally, we have evidence of cultural activity among early humans, such as the 35,000-year-old paintings in Chauvet Cave in France. When we get to 11,000 BCE, we enter a new era of human history, the Neolithic or New Stone Age. This period of time saw stone tools still being made and used by humans, but there were other crucial developments that fundamentally changed the nature of human life. This era will last until roughly 3000 BCE, when bronze replaced stone as the main material used for tools. The biggest factor in the changes seen during the Neolithic era was environmental change. 11,000 BCE coincides with the end of the last ice age, so glaciers were retreating north while temperatures were rising. The area we want to focus on for this presentation is called the Fertile Crescent, because it's roughly crescent-shaped appropriately, and the areas within this highlighted region were the areas humans in the west first began settling down and creating permanent villages. In the Fertile Crescent, we see more wild grains growing in larger amounts due to increasing temperatures, as well as new animals roaming the region in the wake of retreating glaciers. Human bands still relied on gathering wild grains rather than growing grains themselves, but the abundance of different grains and extended growing seasons led to these bands hanging out around one area for longer. The abundance of food, both plant and animal, led to population growth, and population growth would lead to food production, or farming, in order to feed the increasing number of people. Food production, in turn, led to more sedentary lives in larger settlements, as villages grew into towns and then into cities. It's around this time in human history in the West that the characteristics of civilization began to appear. The existence of political, religious, and social structures, along with an urban focus, the evolution of cultural and intellectual pursuits, and writing. At this point, we should discuss the phrase Western civilization and break down what that term means, as well as what its component parts, Western and civilization, mean. Historian Jackson Spielvogel argues that the six characteristics previously mentioned are those many historians agree are the hallmark of what a civilization is. However, some of them seem a bit arbitrary, like writing and an urban focus. Including those two in the definition of civilization means that cultures that did not develop the ability to write and didn't live in towns and cities were quote, uncivilized, which is not true. There are examples of sophisticated African tribes as well as tribal cultures in North America that didn't develop writing. 
but claiming that those groups were, quote, uncivilized simply because they didn't write stuff down or live in cities with walls misses how developed those cities were. We've also seen in cave paintings shown earlier that nomadic people were engaging in cultural pursuits, which implies that settled societies weren't the only ones who had time for artistic endeavors. Additionally, what precisely is meant by Western? Does it simply mean West of Asia? Well, Africa is West of Asia, but outside of Egypt, we don't include much African history in a Western civilization course. Speaking of, why exactly do we include Egypt in a course focusing on European history? Why is that one slice of Africa taken out of African history and appended to European history? Likewise, why do we cover Mesopotamia, located in the modern Middle East, in a largely Europe-centered course? There's a strong argument to be made that including Egypt and Mesopotamia allows modern Europe, and by extension the United States and Canada, both of which are usually included in the idea of Western civilization, to trace its history and legacy not just back to ancient Rome and Greece, but also to the glories of Egypt and even to the first civilizations that existed in the West. As if once those initial cultures emerged, history moved inevitably towards Europe, as though European and American domination of the globe was somehow the unavoidable outcome history was propelled towards. This kind of teleological thinking, the idea that there is a predetermined endpoint or goal the passage of time and societal development are destined to meet, should be avoided in history, as every moment from the past had numerous potential outcomes. Every decision could have been easily made differently. There are many historians who argue the idea of Western civilization needs to be rethought, as it currently seems to be more than a bit exclusionary, privileging city dwellers, and eventually becoming quite Eurocentric. Despite the problems of defining what a civilization really is, the results of food production and settling down were pretty clear. Human population increased. Food security could be achieved, as people learned to store excess food for future uses. Labor and resources produced by domesticated animals like sheep and goats were available. Labor specialization began as not everyone was needed to produce food and could therefore begin doing other things, like specializing in fighting to protect the society or making various items that could be traded with other cities. And finally, that labor specialization gave human groups the space and time to innovate and invent, leading to new technologies that could help humans live better lives. However, not everything about settling down and growing your own food was awesome. The combination of food, production, and settlement also led to the increased spread of diseases, especially those that jumped from animals to humans living in close proximity, social stratification, and the beginning of wealth disparities, as some began to accumulate more stuff, especially more valuable stuff, than did others. Gender division as women became increasingly relegated to the home to have and raise children, while men performed what was deemed the more important work in society. And finally, environmental degradation caused by farming and other human activities. For example, it's estimated that the world has lost 50% of its trees since humans began settling down to farm. All of these negatives, and others, have led some historians, like James C. Scott in his book The Art of Not Being Governed, to question the usual story told of the development of human cultures. In his book, Scott argues that the normal story of cities becoming magnets for people who want better lives is flawed. Rather than leaving the hinterlands for the benefits of settled farming, Scott posits that people on the fringes of societies were there purposefully and were resisting or trying to escape the reach of kings and other forms of government that were developing in cities. Scott's theory should remind us that sedentary states and food production were not inevitable, and that many humans weren't living in settled societies 9,000 years ago. We've now completed the second topic of this presentation, the Neolithic Revolution and its consequences. So let's take a breath and review the main points of this section. First, the Neolithic Age refers to the time when human life was fundamentally changed by becoming more sedentary, 
or settled in one location, and learning how to domesticate crops and animals. Second, due to a warming climate, the Fertile Crescent saw longer growing seasons, more wild crops, and more wild animals, allowing humans in the area to begin settling down in one area for longer. Third, some historians argue that a civilization needs certain characteristics to be considered as such. Political, religious, and social structures, an urban focus, cultural pursuits, and writing. Finally, the term Western civilization is problematic for two main reasons. The term Western is inconsistent and leads to some areas, like Egypt and Mesopotamia, be included in a European history course while others are excluded. Additionally, the term civilization is exclusionary and self-serving, seeing as how its definition was created conveniently by those who already had each of those six characteristics. Now that we've laid the foundation for the beginning of settled, food-producing human societies, let's get to the political and religious structures in ancient Mesopotamia and Egypt. Let's pick up on the idea of sedentarism, that is, the concept of human groups giving up the nomadic lifestyle for a more settled one. Once people began settling down permanently, they could begin acquiring a greater number of goods than they could before, with some people accumulating much more than others. This difference in the amount of stuff one possessed, especially if that stuff one possessed was valuable to others, led to increasing social stratification or division into different groups based on how much wealth you possessed. If you had a great amount of stuff that other people wanted but couldn't get, that gave you power over those people, making you an influential person in your society. Additionally, some people began to gain control over trade networks that were developing between cities giving them added prestige and status in the society, as well as control over other people. In early Mesopotamia, some settlements began as food storage centers, while others started as religious shrines to local deities. Over time, as the population grew, more people visited those shrines and made offerings to the gods, offerings which needed managing. Hence, a group of specialized priests emerged to manage the shrine and the resources donated to it. Eventually, those shrines would grow into temples and then temple complexes that commanded a great deal of offerings from local people. Priests would manage the temples and redistribute the offerings made. It's important to note that at this point in Mesopotamian history, there were no separate political leaders. The cities were guided by the priests who managed the temple and maintained a good relationship with the gods. It won't be until roughly 2900 BCE that we begin to see leaders separate from the priesthood emerge. Cities in Mesopotamia not only traded, but they also competed for access to resources. This competition led to conflict and open warfare, requiring armies and individuals to lead those armies. Powerful, militaristic families led by Lugals, roughly translated as big men, claimed a share of power and began passing that power on to their sons. This marks the development of a power structure separate from the priests, one based on militarism and strength of arms. One of the consequential developments in Mesopotamia is the invention of empire. Some of the leaders in Mesopotamian history will take steps that set important precedents for leaders thousands of years later, whether or not those later leaders were conscious of the origins of their ideas. Sargon I of Akkad was the first man in the West to create what we think of as an empire. Before him, Mesopotamian cities would compete, go to war, and the loser would pay the winner tribute, or a fee for losing the war. No one would conquer or take control of another city, at least not until Sargon. His innovative idea was to not only defeat another city in battle, but to install a chosen person to act as the new leader of that city in Sargon's name. This direct political control also gave Sargon more direct access to and control of the natural resources and trade routes of other cities vastly expanding his wealth beyond anything other Mesopotamian kings had. Another important precedent was set by Hammurabi, king of Babylon. Hammurabi used writing as a weapon, 
spreading lies and rumors about other leaders in order to get the states surrounding Babylon to turn on each other and fight, thus making them weaker while Hammurabi waited and grew his army. Eventually, he was ready to strike and quickly took over his weakened neighbors, creating his own empire. This will not be the last time we see the use of duplicity to gain personal advantage in history. Hammurabi was also able to unite his empire together with a law code that applied to everyone. He was not the first to do this, but his law code is perhaps the most famous of the ancient world and has survived to us today. We see in this first photo the top of the stone stela, or pillar, that the code of Hammurabi was inscribed on. Here Hammurabi is receiving the law from the god Shamash, god of light, truth, and justice. The code is located in the Louvre Museum in Paris, where I took this photo, as evidenced by this next photo of yours truly with the code, which is obviously another reason why the code of Hammurabi is so famous. So you're welcome, Hammurabi. Now that we've completed our look at some of the political developments of Mesopotamia, let's take a moment to review what we've learned before we move on to Egypt. First, more settled people can accumulate more stuff and those who could obtain more valuable stuff than others became more powerful. Second, many cities in Mesopotamia began as religious sites that grew in size and were managed by priests. And it wasn't until around 2900 BCE that we see political leaders who were separate from the priests. Third, Sargon I was the first in the West to create an empire by installing chosen leaders of conquered cities. Finally, Hammurabi used writing to weaken the cities around him and to devise a law code that united his empire under one legal code. Egypt lies to the west of Mesopotamia and, like it, revolved around a river. The Nile River flowed, and still does, from south to north, spreading out into a 250-mile wide delta at the Mediterranean coast. The river effectively united the population and allowed Egypt to have the longest running polity in history. The first known permanent settlement in Egypt appears by 4750 BCE. By 3200 BCE, we see cities developing in Upper Egypt. The reason why Upper Egypt is to the south of Lower Egypt is because the upper part of a river is near the origin, while the lower part is near the end point. Because the Nile flows south to north, the southern part is upper, while the northern part is lower Egypt. It's a bit confusing, I know, but we all just have to deal with it. By 3100 BCE, distinct kingdoms had emerged, one in lower Egypt based around the delta, another in upper Egypt. Roughly around 3000 BCE, both kingdoms were united by Narmer, known to the Greeks as Medes, beginning a united kingdom that will last for nearly 3,000 years until it gets absorbed into the Roman Empire. Ancient Egypt was led by figures called pharaohs. This name not only referred to the person who led, but also to the entire administrative state that surrounded and aided that person. This concept meant that pharaoh was bigger than one person, and therefore Egyptian rule wasn't dependent upon the strength of any individual ruler, but would continue on past the life of one person. The centralized office of pharaoh would ensure stability and longevity. Egyptian history is normally broken into five periods, the Old, Middle, and New Kingdoms, with brief interludes between called intermediate periods. The kingdoms are normally viewed as more stable and secure, while the intermediate periods are thought to be more chaotic. Although that's a gross oversimplification of Egyptian history, for the purposes of this class, it's the one we're going to go with. The Old Kingdom of Egypt lasted from 2686 to 2160 BCE. During these centuries, all of Egypt's resources, both natural and acquired through trade, were owned by the pharaoh, who could dispose of them however he liked. The pharaoh wasn't alone in administering the kingdom, however. During the Old Kingdom, local governors called nomarchs were appointed to control certain territories and were expected to carry out the orders of the pharaoh. Eventually, these positions became hereditary, and some nomarchs gained enough power and influence in their own right to challenge the power and legitimacy of the pharaoh. 
This challenge to royal power, again to oversimplify things, led to the first intermediate period from 2160 to 2055 BCE, when competitors for power fought over who would rule Egypt. The first intermediate period came to an end in 2055 BCE when Mentuhotep II reunified Egypt under his rule, thus beginning the Middle Kingdom, which would last from 2055 to 1650 BCE. There was an important change, though, in the theory of leadership. In Middle Kingdom Egypt, pharaohs were seen less as godly beings and more as shepherds of their people. They were looked at as divinely chosen individuals who would earn their place in the afterlife only if they successfully protected their people and didn't harm them in any way. It's time for another break and a review as we finished our look at political developments in Egypt's Old and Middle Kingdoms. First, Narmer, or Menes, was the first to unite Upper and Lower Egypt around 3000 BCE. Second, Egyptian history is normally broken up into more peaceful eras known as kingdoms, and more chaotic years known as intermediate periods. Third, Egypt was led by a pharaoh whose office was permanent, meaning it would outlive each individual occupant and ensure stability. Fourth, the pharaoh was assisted in running the kingdom by nomarchs or local governors, some of whom became so powerful they challenged the pharaoh's power. And finally, during Egypt's Middle Kingdom, pharaohs were looked at as divinely chosen beings whose place in the afterlife would be secured only if they looked out for the well-being of their people. As we discussed earlier, some cities began as religious shrines to local gods, then became temple complexes led by priests as the population grew. The priesthood managed the temple and redistributed the offerings to those in need. There was also no separate political leadership at this time. So in the earliest centuries of Mesopotamian history, religious leaders were political leaders, whose power was justified because it was thought they had a special insight or connection to the gods and could help maintain a good relationship with them. With the creation of the West's first empire by Sargon, we see political and military leaders beginning to use religion as a means of both justifying their claim to power and enhancing that power. Sargon I began the practice of linking various gods to each other, thus tying people in different Mesopotamian cities together through the worship of the, quote, same gods. For example, the Akkadian fertility goddess Ishtar became associated with the Sumerian goddess Inanna. Thus, Sargon tried to convince people that the two goddesses were really one and the same, or at least two different manifestations of the same goddess. So the people worshipping them had something in common, something that united them. Sargon also took the step of making his daughter Enhedwana the chief priestess of the cities of Ur and Uruk, two of the earliest cities in Mesopotamia. Sargon once again hoped to knit people together in conquered cities by placing one religious official, in this case his daughter, in charge of both cities. Other leaders followed Sargon's example and in later centuries placed family members in important positions as a means of maintaining their power and control. Hammurabi took a bit of a different angle and instead of combining different deities, insisted that every conquered city worship the Babylonian god Marduk over all of their other gods. This isn't quite monotheism, the belief in a single god because Hammurabi allowed people to still worship lots of gods and goddesses. But he demanded that they also worship Marduk, and that god would be the prime god above all the rest. This was a new development in Western history, as Hammurabi became the first ruler to wage wars of conquest in the name of a specific god, something we'll see again many times during the course of Western Civ I. Moving west to Egypt, We've already seen the pharaohs were the unquestioned leaders who controlled all of the kingdom's resources. Additionally, pharaohs played a religious role, as they became, through some unknown process, linked with the divine and were thought to be reborn in an afterlife upon dying in this life. Pharaohs in the Old Kingdom thus became the primary link between the people and the land they lived on and the gods they believed in and worshipped. However, a change in this attitude toward pharaohs occurred near the end of the Old Kingdom, 
as the priesthood at the city of Nekin, the location of the original unification of Upper and Lower Egypt, sought to check the pharaoh's power by arguing he was not divine himself, but rather a divinely chosen human to perform certain tasks. This argument struck at the very reason pharaohs were who they were, and did much to weaken the last pharaohs of the Old Kingdom and allow nomarchs to rise against them as we examined earlier. This view of pharaohs as divinely chosen humans would persist into the Middle Kingdom, when it was assumed that a pharaoh's divinity depended upon him maintaining a good relationship with the gods and doing everything in his power to protect his people. We've now finished our examination of religious developments in both Mesopotamia and Egypt, so it's once again time for a short review of the main points of this section. First, politics and religion were intertwined in Mesopotamia, as Sargon I linked various deities to Akkadian gods and placed his daughter in charge of the spiritual well-being of two important cities. Second, Hammurabi also blended politics and religion by making everyone he conquered worship the Babylonian god Marduk above all others, though he let people keep their own gods. Finally, we saw how in Egypt's old kingdom, pharaohs were seen as divine beings who were the link between the earthly and spiritual realms, but in the Middle Kingdom, that view had changed, with pharaohs now seen as divinely chosen, but required to protect their people as a means of achieving the afterlife. Let's move on to the social structure of the ancient world, beginning with the effects of settling down. When humans began settling in villages, towns, and cities, that permanence allowed people to accumulate more stuff than they could have as hunter-gatherers. Some began to accumulate more stuff and more valuable stuff than others, as we've seen earlier. This accumulation of wealth and valuables led to differentiation between people, leading to the emergence of social classes based on how many resources one possessed and how much control over access to resources one had. In terms of gender, settled women could have more children than could nomadic women, which meant they spent more time pregnant and more time taking care of young children. This effectively relegated women to the home, while men took over what were deemed more important tasks, such as growing and storing the food that fed the society. Men also dominated the political and religious positions of power, except for priestesses, and these tasks meant raising children came to be defined as women's work, giving rise to patriarchal societies run almost exclusively by men. Good thing we've evolved past those backward notions, he said sarcastically. In Mesopotamia, more specifically, the social hierarchy looked something like this. The top level of society consisted of the political and religious elites, the priests who managed the temples, and the military leaders who fought wars of defense and of conquest. Next came everyone else. But that everyone else category was divided into two general groups. First, roughly half of the non-elite population was made up of independent farmers who grew crops for themselves and for trade. The other half consisted of farmers and artisans whose work depended on the existence of the elites because they made food and stuff for them. Food was produced specifically for the priests and priestesses so that they didn't have to do that they could spend their time communing with the gods. Trade goods were also produced by artisans that were then taken by political leaders for the express purpose of trading them to various cities for other types of goods, goods the elites monopolized access to. This other half of the population also included enslaved people. Sadly, one common theme that runs through all of these ancient societies and will continue for millennia is the existence of slavery. In Mesopotamian kingdoms, native enslaved people, meaning those originating from somewhere in Mesopotamia, had to be released after three years. Foreign enslaved people, those not originally from Mesopotamia, could be held indefinitely and were bought and sold as property. Evidence for the existence of social classes can be found in Hammurabi's code which has provisions specifically indicating that some people were considered part of a higher caste than were other people in society. 
The code also privileges men in society, although it does take care to offer women certain protections that other societies, both contemporary and later, won't bother to give them. In Egypt, the top of the social pyramid was occupied by the pharaoh and his family. Next came a class of nobles, wealthy aristocrats who aided the pharaoh and were rewarded with lands and riches. After the class of nobles came everyone else in Egypt who was free. And finally, enslaved people were at the bottom of the social pyramid. Artisans and craftsmen did valuable work for society, producing many of the goods that were then traded. But that work didn't get them any social benefits. There was no such thing as a middle class as we would define it in ancient Egypt. Women had important rights in Egyptian society. They could initiate divorce, own property, and act as witnesses in court cases. However, many of those rights were claimed by upper-class Egyptian women. This is a phenomenon we'll see again and again this semester. The women who had at least some rights were usually wealthier women, who used their wealth and status to gain rights that poor women could not. Distinctions between men and women were less clear among the peasantry, where women worked alongside men in many professions. Sexual equality did not exist in ancient Egypt, as men were allowed to have sexual relations with multiple women, and upper-class men often had harems of secondary wives, while women could not have extramarital affairs with other men, and the punishments for doing so were often severe. Now that we've completed our look at social structure in Mesopotamia and Egypt, let's take a brief minute to review the main ideas we've learned. First, once humans became more settled, social classes and gender divisions emerged. Second, because settled women could have more children, they became increasingly relegated to having and raising children, as well as chores around the home and garden, while men took over the farming and political work. Third, in Mesopotamia, the social structure was simply the elites and those who worked directly for them, and then everyone else, including enslaved people. Fourth, in Egypt, the social structure involved the pharaoh and family at the top, rich aristocrats at the next level, every free person after that, and finally, enslaved people at the bottom. Finally, in Egypt, wealthy women did have some freedoms in society non-wealthy women did not have, but it was still a largely patriarchal society. Moving on to cultural developments, we see in Mesopotamia by 3300 BCE, Clay tablets were being used to write on, and symbols called pictograms were being employed as a writing system. Pictograms were just that, pictures of actual objects that at first communicated the object itself. For instance, a picture of a bowl literally meant bowl. Over time, this system added special markings to the pictures to indicate more abstract concepts and eventually sounds. For example, a certain mark on a picture of a bowl would indicate the idea of hunger, while a different mark would indicate the sound for bowl in the spoken language. That essentially makes for three alphabets, one for the objects themselves, one for abstract concepts, one for sounds. By 3100 BCE, the Mesopotamians developed cuneiform, or wedge-shaped writing. The stylus used to make marks in clay tablets was made out of reeds, and could not make some of the drawings required by the pictographic alphabet. But it could make different kinds of wedges. These wedges replaced the pictographic system and simplified the number of symbols from 1200 to just 600. Writing in Mesopotamia initially developed to maintain economic records, but soon it was used for a variety of things. The Epic of Gilgamesh is the greatest literature tale from the ancient world. It tells the story of a Babylonian king who raises the ire of the gods who send a wild creature to destroy him, but the two become fast friends who go on numerous adventures together. The gods will eventually kill the wild Enkidu, an event which sends Gilgamesh on a futile quest for the key to everlasting life. The tale weaves together certain Mesopotamian beliefs, such as the civilizing force of cities, the involvement of the gods in human affairs, and the inevitability of death. 
The Mesopotamians also used writing in the form of mathematics, which they became very good at. They also developed a 12-month lunar calendar, created numerous maps of the world as they knew it, and as we talked about earlier, employed writing in the promulgation of law codes. Mesopotamians also created many items made of bronze. They made wheels for both pottery and transportation, and they developed the seed drill, a special plow that dropped seeds at regular intervals directly into the trough made by the plow. This technology would not reemerge in the West until the 16th century or the 1500s CE. In Egypt, by 3200 BCE, hieroglyphics or sacred writings were in use. They also developed a separate script for day-to-day -day business called hieratic, along with a shorthand version for easier note-taking. Rather than the clay tablets used in Mesopotamia, the Egyptians used papyrus, which could be rolled and was therefore more portable. Papyrus decays easily, however, even in Egypt's arid climate, as opposed to clay tablets which, when fired, become nearly indestructible. Much of Egyptian culture and writing centers around their mythology, at the heart of which was the myth of Osiris and Isis. According to the tale, Osiris' brother Set, or Seth, jealous of Osiris, killed him and cut his body into dozens of pieces that were scattered across Egypt. Osiris' wife Isis worked to find those pieces and put them back together, which serves as the origin story of the practice of mummification. After finding nearly all of his parts, Isis revived Osiris and mated with him one last time before he became the Lord of the Dead. This produced the god Horus, who along with Isis, defeated Set. The myth focuses on some of the most important values and beliefs of ancient Egypt, order, death, and renewal. For ancient Egyptians, death was a journey to another life, one that was very much like this one, only better. Initially, this afterlife was reserved for only the pharaoh and his family, but by the Middle Kingdom, more people could have access to it. According to Egyptian lore, a deceased person's ka, or their spirit, would wander the underworld looking for Osiris. Once found, Osiris and 42 judges would weigh the deceased's heart against a feather. A true and just person's ka would weigh no more than the feather, and would be granted immortality, reborn as an aspect of Osiris. An unjust ka, however, would simply cease to exist. Egyptian books and tombs were filled with advice and guidance on how the deceased can avoid the demons of the underworld and how to find Osiris. Tombs were also filled with goods enjoyed by the deceased during life, with the thought that they'd need sustenance in the afterlife. Even favorite animals have been found mummified in various tombs so that the animal's ka can join its owner in the next world. The emphasis on being a good ruler is part of the Egyptian concept of ma'at, the belief in order, truth, and justice. It's an inherently conservative concept that also rejects change for change's sake, out of a concern that changing things could lead to disorder and chaos. Egyptians needed to show Osiris that they lived according to the prescripts of Ma'at in order to be rewarded with an afterlife. It's now time for our final review for the Unit 1 presentation on Mesopotamia and Egypt. So let's take a minute to think about the main points of what we just learned about culture. First, in Mesopotamia, the pictographic writing system was abandoned in favor of cuneiform, or wedge-shaped writing, which was used for literature like the Epic of Gilgamesh and mathematics. Second, in Egypt, there were three different scripts, hieroglyphics, hieratic, and a shorthand version of hieratic. Third, and finally, Egyptian culture centers on their religious mythology, including the myth of Osiris and Isis, which demonstrates Egyptian belief in concepts such as death and rebirth, as well as ma'at, the belief in truth, order, and justice. That wraps up Unit 1 on Mesopotamia and Egypt. In this lesson, we looked at the development of political and religious structures, examined how religion was used to justify political power, investigated how social classes came into being in the ancient world, and finally we explored some of the culture, especially writing, of these initial Western cultures. 
If you have any questions about the material covered in this opening lesson, please leave a comment below or send me an email if you are a student of mine. Additionally, here's a list of books you can check out if you'd like to know more about the topics of today's lesson. Finally, if you're going to leave a comment, please don't make me regret opening up the comment section in these videos. I'm going to regret opening up the comment section in these videos, aren't I? Ah well, I'm sure it'll be fine. Just fine. Thanks for watching everyone, and I'll see you all again in the next video.